weekly Gecko session, the first of 2021. My name is Chris Cassinides. I chair the Gastro Foundation of Sub-Saharan Africa, and we're sponsor these weekly Gecko sessions. As you will have noticed, the sessions have changed from the Thursday four, four o'clock slot to a Wednesday 4.30 slot, and these will be on a weekly basis. They will follow much the same as the format from last year, alternating with a different subtopic every, every week. Um, and we have included a pathology, which had a tremendous, into, which um, was uh, tremendously supported last year. And we also this year introduce a multidisciplinary uh, liver cancer screening and treatment program, which will be uh, run by Ed Jonas. So I hope you benefit from these sessions. I hope that we have feedback from you on how we can best improve them. And uh, we look forward to seeing you at this weekly slot. So I'll hand over now to uh, Masheko Sushedi, who will chair the PATH session, and I hope you enjoy it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chris. Um, and uh, as Chris says, uh, welcome to all of you uh, in 2021. And uh, I think it is fitting today that uh, we have Prof. Martin Hale, and uh, he's going to talk to us about the approach to the normal microanatomy of the liver. And then thereafter, we'll have a case presentation by Dr. Bilal Bobat. They're both based at the um, Donald Gordon uh, Center in Johannesburg, uh, affiliated to Wits uh, University. Up until now, we've had 88 registrations, uh, and we have about half the people online, and uh, I'm hoping that uh, more people will join uh, as we move along. Uh, Prof. Martin Hale, uh, over to you, and we look forward to your talk. Hi, uh, thanks. Uh, thanks very much, Mash, and uh, uh, welcome everybody to uh, to the new year. And I hope you're all keeping well. And I hope that uh, you have a, um, a healthy and prosperous uh, 2021, and that you keep safe from the uh, from the current pandemic. So, as uh, Mash has said, uh, we are uh, going to uh, have a short discussion on the approach to the. Uh, on, a, on the approach to the to the normal liver biopsy, and uh, what I want to really do is is effectively uh, 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 get this presentation really more directed, not necessarily to the consultant histopathologist, uh, but certainly to many of the junior staff and trainees who often uh, find uh, liver biopsies uh, pretty daunting. And I think it's important to to really say that. The approach to the liver biopsy and interpretation of liver biopsies is, uh, is very much dependent uh, on your understanding of the normal microanatomy. And if you understand the plumbing as you were of the, of the liver and how everything flows and the structure, you really shouldn't have a problem in, uh, in working out um, what is wrong with the pathology. Because like many of the organs, the liver really responds uh, in a fairly uniform way uh, to any, uh, any pathologies and insults uh, that uh, it uh, faces. I think it's important also to recognize that uh, the liver is, is um, one of the uh, main organs. In fact, it is the main organ that uh, is involved with uh, detoxification and anything that goes into our bodies, whether it's through the air, through the venous system, uh, uh, through the gastrointestinal tract, everything ultimately ends up in the liver. So it uh, is an extremely resilient organ. And uh, during the course of, of uh, the year, we'll, uh, we'll focus more on specific uh, pathological mechanisms and disease processes. So before we do so, then let's, uh, let's go into some of the basic uh, fundamentals of, of liver pathology. So there's a typical autopsy appearance of the liver, <clears throat> excuse me, and you can see uh, for example, that uh, here we've got the heart, uh, the diaphragm is there, so it's immediately uh, in the subdiaphragmatic uh, space uh, in the abdomen and in situated in the right hypochondrium. You can see the left and the right lobes, uh, the right lobe being considerably larger uh, than the left lobe. And there's a net image uh, which uh, shows you um, the um, images uh, uh, from the various aspects of the liver, the anterior, the inferior, and the posterior aspects. And what is important, <clears throat> is, excuse me, is the 
uh, are the anatomical relationships uh, between the other organs. Now, during the course of the year, we're going to talk a fair bit about this particular area, this being the porta hepatis. And uh, that is a vitally important area because there's a lot happening in that particular part of the liver, which uh, has a very important bearing uh, on the outcome of liver function. But as I said, more of that in subsequent uh, lectures. So this then is, the is, a, is a macro photograph then of what we would call normal liver. And this, uh, if you want to know what normal liver looks like, those of you who haven't uh, seen autopsies or are about to undertake autopsies, normal liver looks like the liver that you get in a, in a supermarket. And human beings' uh, liver is no different. It has a reddish brown color and it's uh, particularly smooth. You can see the smooth surface and you can see the vascular structures. These represent the, uh, the portal tracts and also the uh, venous outflows uh, from, from the liver. So normal liver then uh, looks, looks like this. And it's important to remember that from a macroscopic point of view. Now microscopically uh, and from a microanatomy point of view, this is probably the most important slide that you need to remember. And uh, this, uh, this lecture will be uh, available online. You can get it uh, from the foundation website. But it's important to remember, as I said, the drainage and the so-called plumbing of the liver. So here you have, for example, the portal tract, and you can see that we've got the hepatic artery, we have the bile duct, and we have the portal vein. And these are situated in the portal tract, and the portal tract is also known as the triad. And the reason it's called the triad is because of the three structures that are present uh, in those particular portal tracts. Now, this is the traditional lobule, uh, and um, the, um, the structure is useful to uh, remember it as this hexagonal appearance, where you've got at the apices, you've got the portal tracts. So you've got a portal tract there, a portal tract there, another one there. And at the center of the lobule, you have what we call the central vein. Now, in some textbooks, you will also see the central vein referred to as, a, as the hepatic vein. But strictly speaking, the hepatic vein is a larger vein, uh, but certainly you can, you can uh, refer to the central vein also as the hepatic vein. So that can sometimes be a little bit confusing. The next important thing to remember is that we will talk sometimes about perivenular disease. And when certainly I mention about perivenular disease, I always refer to disease and changes that, is, that are taking place around the central vein. And I don't necessarily refer to perivenular change involving the, the portal vein. The next important thing to remember is the blood supply. So the blood supply from the, uh, uh, to, at least to the liver, is derived from the hepatic artery, which uh, receives its uh, supply uh, from, the, uh, from the celiac axis, uh, which is uh, derived from the aorta, and also from the portal vein. Sorry, I just tried to find the pointer here. It seems to be disappearing. So you've got the portal vein here, which is, uh, takes blood from the, uh, from the bowel. And uh, important to remember, in fact, that uh, the, um, uh, that the uh, sorry, I'm being a little bit distracted by this, by, by this pop-up. And it's unfortunately blocking the um, uh, blocking the uh, uh, the arrow, but so so the uh, portal tract then delivers a combination of deoxygenated blood from the uh, from the bowel and oxygenated blood from the hepatic artery, and that's very important to remember because that blood, which is a mixture of oxygenated and unoxygenated blood, is delivered to the sinusoids and then flows through the sinusoids uh, through to the central vein and exits the liver. Now it's important to remember that the hepatocytes uh, that are closest to the uh, portal tract have the best advantage from a point of view of the oxygenated blood and also the nutrients that are uh, present in that blood. Whereas the hepatocytes that are situated in this part of the lobule uh, adjacent to the central vein they, if you like, are, as I say to the students, they are living on the edge. They are particularly susceptible to any toxic insult that, uh, that may be occurring. 
and uh, as a result, uh, they um, are uh, particularly susceptible to anything uh, that may may occur. Bile flow on the uh, happens in a reverse direction. Bile flow uh, flows along the biliary canaliculi, uh, along the sinusoids, at least along the biliary canaliculi, and exits through the bile duct. Now, before we move on to the next slide, we then, in, uh, as a result of this flow, are able to divide the zones of the liver, or these, these hepatocytes, into three zones. Zone one and zone three. And zone two is in the middle. So zone one then are the hepatocytes that lie adjacent to the portal tracts, whereas zone three uh, are those hepatocytes that are adjacent to the central vein. And zone two is somewhere in the middle. Now, often what happens is that you get pathology in zone three, and uh, that sometimes extends into zone two. And it's important really to identify uh, from a zonation point of view where this pathology is occurring, because that will give you a clue as to what is happening. So zone three pathology, for example, is often related to toxic, uh, uh, toxic insults. And um, I seem to have lost the pointer again. Uh, and uh, whereas um, if it is spotty necrosis or pan zone or necrosis, that tends to suggest that it's probably more of an infectious etiology. So moving on to the next slide then, this is a photograph, a photomicrograph of a liver. And here you can see the central vein. Here you can see the portal tract. You can see the bile duct, the portal vein. And somewhere in here is the hepatic arteriole. I think that's probably the hepatic arteriole. And here I've overlaid the different zones of the liver. And you can see zone three around the central vein, zone one, in the periportal regions, and then zone two in between. Notice that there is a slight uh, color difference between the hepatocytes. You can see that these are particularly healthy hepatocytes, whereas these here are showing a little bit of accumulation of pigment, probably a little bit of bile pigment, could also be a lipofuscin pigment, which tends to occur in the zone three hepatocytes. In three dimension form, this is what you see. And here you can see uh, similarly, you can see the triad with the, um, with the bile duct, the portal vein, and the hepatic arteriole. So there's the uh, portal vein, the bile duct, and the hepatic arteriole. And here you have the central vein, which in turn drains in to the hepatic vein. Now, an overview of liver diseases, and I'm not going to go into this into any detail because we will talk about this in more lectures, but you can divide them like everything into congenital causes, metabolic causes, chemical causes, infections, which in turn, of course, you can divide into bacterial and viral illnesses, autoimmune illness, obstructive, whether it's uh, arterial, venous, or, or biliary, and then, of course, neoplastic disease, once again, uh, whether it is uh, uh, based on uh, uh, paracellular pathology or cholangiopathic pathology, or, or uh, cells in the, in the sinuses, or in the, in the sinusoids, I should say. Now, as far as general pathology is concerned, steatosis is often seen. So fatty change uh, is one of the features of, um, of liver disease. And that comes about because uh, the fatty change is a reflection of the liver's inability to transport fat. And that comes about because the uh, lipoproteins uh, the production of the lipoproteins is impaired, but consequently fat accumulates in the cytoplasm of the liver. It does not mean that the patient is necessarily obese or indeed has some disorder of lipid metabolism. So remember then that fatty change is a nonspecific response, often. Now, there's been a change to the classification of, um, uh, of uh, fat in the liver. And uh, this has come about because of the confusion between macrovesicular and microvesicular fatty change. Now, in the old days, we used to talk about macrovesicular fatty change, and we used to talk about microvesicular fatty change. Now, the problem comes that microvesicular fatty change is also associated with some sinister changes in the liver, particularly, for example, tetracycline toxicity, 
acute fatty liver of pregnancy and so on. And those conditions, in fact, are often fatal. So uh, it was decided, in fact, to change that and reserve the term microvesicular change to uh, fatty change or um, change which occurs, the accumulation of fat, which occurs in the liver in patients who have uh, more sinister uh, disease. Whereas um, we now talk about macrovesicular fatty change as being large droplet and the uh, small droplet steatosis replacing microvesicular steatosis. But it's important to remember that this is a continuum from small droplet to large droplet. And in fact, this concept of just pure uh, small droplet steatosis and, uh, and large droplet uh, steatosis is really a misnomer. What happens is that as fat accumulates in the liver, so the small droplets eventually coalesce and uh, become large droplets. So what distinguishes between the two? Well, I think uh, as a general rule, uh, I personally use the size of the hepatocyte nucleus. Uh, a, nu uh, a droplet that's the size of the hepatocyte nucleus, I usually call small droplet, uh, and anything larger is a large droplet. Important also, another feature, is the location of the nucleus in the cytoplasm, because a large droplet will displace the nucleus to the periphery of the cell, whereas a small droplet uh, won't. And often, in fact, you can get multiple small droplets in a single hepatocyte, and often those uh, uh, ring uh, the, um, uh, the nucleus. So it's bland steatosis, whereas true microvesicular steatosis causes a foamy cytoplasm. And if you want to know the difference in true microvesicular fatty change, you are unable to count the number of droplets. Fatty change is often zonal, and typically it occurs in zone three. And you remember that I said that it's the zone three hepatocytes that are living on the edge. So consequently, if they are compromised, if their metabolic function is compromised in any way, then those will be the hepatocytes that show fatty change uh, to begin with. As disease progresses, then in fact, that fatty change in fact may become panzonal. It can extend into zone two and into zone three. Important to recognize that the causes of fatty change may be numerous. So there's a typical picture then. Once again, the liver that you go and buy in the supermarket, whereas this is a, a patient, this is actually a child with kwashiorkor, and here you can see this extensive yellow color, and you can see quite clearly the difference between the liver here and the liver there. Notice that this particular liver is also fairly uniform, and in fact, a liver, for example, in a patient with kwashiorkor, those of you who have done autopsies uh, on patients with kwashiorkor will recognize uh, quite readily that in fact, there's very little pathological change that occurs consequent to patients and children with kwashiorkor. Here's a microscopic, uh, microscopic picture. And here you can see this admixture of small and large droplet steatosis. This is zone one. Uh, uh, you can see this, uh, we, we see the portal tract, and around that you've got this extensive uh, uh, um, large and small droplet steatosis. The other thing that is also important to remember is that it's conventional to try and estimate the percentage of hepatocytes that are involved uh, with a large droplet steatosis. We don't count the uh, the droplets that, uh, at least the liver cells that show small droplet steatosis, um, because that's relatively bland. Whereas large droplet steatosis, particularly in patients who have fatty liver disease, secondary to alcoholic steatohepatitis or obesity or other causes, uh, those uh, fatty change there um, causes significant um, progressive liver disease. So it's important to estimate, and it, an eyeball estimate is, is pretty good and uh, important to estimate the extent of the large droplet steatosis. So moving on to the inflammatory changes in the liver. So the first is hepatitis. What do we mean by hepatitis? So I think just to begin with, it's important to say that hepatitis is really just a generic term. And unfortunately, a lot of people use the term hepatitis to imply viral hepatitis which whilst in many patients that is correct, it is actually it's a, a 
from a fundamental point of view is actually incorrect. Hepatitis just means inflammation of the liver and uh, the causes are multifactorial. The inflammation can be acute or chronic. And I think once again, important to remember that there is a specific definition of acute hepatitis and chronic hepatitis. And chronic hepatitis is, is by definition a derangement of liver disease or continuing liver disease after six months of illness. So um, important to recognize that as, an, as a point, but more on that when we talk about hepatitis in future, talk, in future talks. So as I said, it's a generic term and important to remember that the public often talk about they had jaundice as a child or jaundice as an adult or they had jaundice six months ago. So important not to, call, uh, to confuse the two and the causes, as I said, are multifactorial. Drugs, very, very important. You know, all the drugs and the, 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 um, uh, the chemotherapeutic agents, and here yeah, I'm not talking about chemotherapy, I'm just talking about pharmaceutical preparations that patients take. Uh, very, very important to take a drug history uh, in patients because you will be surprised how often drugs uh, and therapeutic medication pops up as a cause of drug-induced liver injury. So drugs and toxins, so uh, one can sort of put together, but don't forget uh, that there are external toxins uh, ranging from uh, alanated hydrocarbons to things such as mushroom poisoning alcohol toxicity, of course, and viruses. And uh, with COVID, for example, we are seeing lots of patients, I've seen quite a few liver biopsies in patients uh, who have um, hepatitis secondary to, to COVID infection. Necrosis often accompanies so hepatitis, that's necrosis of the hepatocytes. They're variable patterns in acute disease. Typically you get lobular inflammation and spotty necrosis. Uh, you can get confluent necrosis of the liver. And then if, depending on the extent of the confluent necrosis, you can either talk about massive or submassive necrosis, or indeed uh, fulminant liver failure or acute liver failure. With chronic disease though, you tend to get interface hepatitis and piecemeal necrosis and bridging necrosis. And it's important to remember that in acute disease, you don't get neutrophils. So if we take, for example, chronic uh, at least uh, uh, let's, let's take um, hepatitis B infection. If somebody develops acute hepatitis B infection, the predominant uh, cellular infiltrate is a, is a lymphocyte. Don't go looking for neutrophils in acute viral hepatitis because you won't find them. Uh, and, uh, what you have to look at is the pattern of injury in the liver. And in fact, uh, we'll be talking about neutrophils uh, just now have a particular connotation. So this then is a patient, this is a, a photograph, uh, at least a, a cartoon that's taken from Underwood's book on general pathology. And uh, here what we have is a portal tract. You can see the lymphocytic inflammatory cell infiltration. You can see the spotty necrosis, which is present. Uh, this is, for example, in zone one. You can see the fatty change, uh, which is occurring consequent to that. And uh, you can see here, uh, spotty necrosis of, of hepatocytes in zone three. Cholestasis occurs as well, ballooning degeneration of hepatocytes and apoptosis. But I want you to specifically to remember this particular pattern. Look at this portal tract, look at the inflammatory cell infiltrate, look at the lobular inflammation. When we go on to chronic hepatitis, though, the situation changes. And here instead, what we have is you can see that the portal tract is now expanded. And in this particular instance, this is bridging fibrosis, which comes about as a result of bridging necrosis. So with progression of the inflammatory infiltrate uh, in the portal tract, you get interface hepatitis and you get uh, what we call uh, piecemeal necrosis. Piecemeal is a very good term because it describes exactly what is happening. And it's a, it's a term which is almost sort of falling out of favor uh, and instead is replaced by interface uh, hepatitis. But the reason why piecemeal necrosis is, is useful is because it describes how one would eat an elephant, for example, or a loaf of bread. And if you were to give it, be given a loaf of bread, you wouldn't be able to put that uh, into your mouth at one stage. What you would do 
is that with your fingers, you would bite or you would break off a small portion of, of bread and then you would eat that. And that's why it is called piecemeal necrosis because that's exactly what's happening is that the chronic inflammatory cell infiltrate is gradually chewing away uh, at the inter at least at the hepatocytes in the interface. So the interface hepatitis is good. It's a good term in that it describes the location uh, of the inflammatory process. In other words, that the interface between the parenchyma and the portal tract. But what it doesn't do is describe the piecemeal nature. And what happens with time is that this uh, piecemeal necrosis occurs and ultimately bites away and uh, gradually it links up uh, with the central vein or another portal tract. And uh, we call that bridging necrosis. And then as we all know, bridging necrosis ultimately is replaced by the deposition of collagen and, uh, and bridging uh, fibrosis occurs. And then ultimately, if the process is not stopped, uh, architectural change occurs and uh, uh, the endpoint is cirrhosis. So I said, look at the portal tract, because as soon as you see this sort of thing, that almost by definition uh, implies that there is a chronic hepatitic process uh, going on in this particular patient. Notice that you still have lobular inflammation and it is present to a variable extent. You still get fatty change and the cause, you would then look for the cause. And it's important always, as I say to the registrars, it's one thing saying that it's a chronic hepatitis. The important thing is, uh, and likewise a cirrhosis, the important thing is to try and identify what the cause is. So in other words, a patient who is reported as having cirrhosis, that's only half the diagnosis. Half the diagnosis because yes, there is cirrhosis, but the management, for example, of a patient with cirrhosis secondary to hepatitis C or hepatitis B is completely different to the management of a patient who has cirrhosis secondary to autoimmune hepatitis. So it's important then to remember that you must uh, make every attempt to make a diagnosis as to what the etiology is. So this is a patient who has acute hepatitis, <coughs> excuse me, and for all intents and purposes, this liver looks a little bit busy. And uh, there's, you can see there's cholestasis uh, in this liver, both intracanalicular cholestasis and intracytoplasmic cholestasis. And you may in fact miss this. And it's important to always look at the special stains because if you look at the pastiastase stain, which is on this particular side here, you can see that the kupfer cells are actually crammed full of steroid pigment. And that tells you that this patient, in fact, is recovering from an acute hepatitic process. So it's actually resolving. But sometimes patients will be biopsied in the cholestatic phase of an acute hepatitic illness. And it is this here that will give you the clue because you could almost pass this over and effectively report it as being normal. This is a patient who is not uncommon to our shores. And uh, this is a patient, in fact, who has submassive or fulminant necrosis secondary to INH. Uh, to INH, as you know, is a commonly used drug in uh, patients with tuberculosis. And uh, we dish these pills out all the time. And uh, yes, I know that uh, we have to treat our patients with tuberculosis. And this is why patients uh, have to be followed up who, for example, are on anti-tuberculous therapy uh, in the uh, possible event, I'm not going to say the unlikely event, in the possible event that they develop drug-induced liver injury. And sometimes these patients can have such florid fulminant hepatitis uh, that in fact they may require liver transplantation in order to survive. So here you can see um, uh, that's a central vein there. You can just see the central vein. This is the portal tract here, and you can see this ductular proliferation. And remember that uh, ductular proliferation is the way the liver regenerates. And here we've got a portal tract with the arteriole, the bowel duct here, and here you've got florid bowel ductular proliferation. And it's important uh, the trainees must remember that when you see this sort of thing, don't mistakenly fall into the trap and say that this patient has glandiopathology because you see uh, uh, because you see cellular proliferation. 
that is the signal to say, beware, this patient has massive necrosis of the liver. And uh, there's a reticulin stain. And uh, you can see, for example, here that you've got uh, regenerating liver. This is not a cirrhotic picture. What you've got here is condensation of the reticulum. Here you've got the portal structures, but this is all condensation of the reticulum. And if the patient recovers, in fact, what happens is that the hepatocytes uh, regrow along the reticulum framework. And if the patient is lucky, the patient's uh, normal microanatomy is restored, restored to normal. So here's a patient with interface hepatitis. You can see this rosetting of lymphocytes around the hepatocytes. And ultimately what happens is that this gradually works its way through the lobule. And here you've got a, um, a, a portal tract there, another portal tract there. And I think just off the screen here is a central vein. But you can see this condensation of the reticulum. And this is the beginnings of, in fact, it's not the beginnings, this is bridging necrosis, and ultimately you would end up with bridging fibrosis, which as you see was, is represented on this mass on trichrome stain with a portal tract there, another portal tract over here, and you can see this bridging which has occurred between two adjacent portal tracts. So this would be architectural distortion, and we would call this uh, F3 fibrosis. And then ultimately with progression of disease, if the patient uh, does not receive appropriate therapy. And it's these, for example, these patients where you need to get to the bottom uh, of this particular cause. And it's very, very important to consult with the physician uh, so that you can establish liver function tests, serology, autoimmune serology, viral serology, in order to see uh, the actual cause uh, of, uh, of, the, um, of, the, of the liver disease. And the end stage then is cirrhosis. Uh, so if I could just go back to there. So for example, if you just say that this is bridging fibrosis and you don't give any other cause, then uh, if this patient, for example, had chronic hepatitis B and you are unable to see uh, the, uh, the um, hepatitis B surface antigen in the liver cells or the plasma cells, for example, in, in autoimmune hepatitis, then the patients would receive an appropriate or suboptimal therapy. And they would then progress to cirrhosis. And the cirrhosis is the end stage of, uh, of chronic liver disease and comes about as a result of stellate activation. And ultimately patients present with, with cirrhosis. And then there is the, the supermarket liver, as I said before, and there is a patient uh, who has a cirrhotic liver. And uh, that concludes it. So thanks very much for listening. Thank you so much, uh, Prof. Um, I think that was a masterclass in understanding uh, anatomy, physiology, and I think it's um, the perfect ground on which uh, to build uh, in future meetings when we discuss pathologies and so forth. Um, I'm just wondering if anybody has a specific question, um, because if, if not, then I think it's not a bad idea to go on to the case uh, and then maybe that will generate uh, other questions uh, related to Prof. Uh, Hale's talk uh, and, of course, uh, the clinical scenario. So if there are no questions, I think we will go on to Bilal, who's uh, named his talk uh, a lockdown special. Uh, over to you, Bilal. Thanks, Prof. Um, right, so, uh, you know, in South Africa, we had a quite a strict lockdown where alcohol was was banned, uh, of course, some people still managed to get their hands uh, on, on various reserves. Um, and this is one of them. This is Mr. NM. He's a 50 year old gentleman um, who initially presented with uh, uh, symptoms of fatigue, nausea, uh, and being jaundiced since August of 2020. Um, he was initially seen by colleagues at a peripheral hospital who admitted him to their ICU um, where he had a, a bacterial pneumonia, but he was also then in renal failure and uh, the referring physician was wise enough to note his uh, worsening liver, uh, liver function. 
of note is that two weeks prior to hospitalization, uh, he did receive uh, a non-steroidal um, intramuscularly. There was no history of any additional herbal uh, medication, no uh, uh, complementary or traditional uh, medication intake either. In terms of this alcohol uh, use, he was consuming a bottle of whiskey uh, a day. And remember that whiskey is approximately 40% proof alcohols. Uh, and uh, therefore, if you take a liter of that, you're talking about uh, approximately 40 to 50 units uh, per day. In addition, and he was also consuming um, uh, some wine, which he wasn't able to uh, necessarily uh, uh, confirm the amount of. His clinical exam, he, uh, he, he was encephalopathic, um, a, a grade one when I initially saw him, deeply, deeply jaundiced, marked anastarka. He had asterixis, pulmonary edema, right-sided uh, pleural effusion. I thought uh, his hepatomegaly was significant below the costal uh, margin, uh, and he had uh, ascites. In terms of his laboratory investigations, he was anemic with an MCV of 106, so that's uh, macrocytic. Platelets were low at 90. His total bilirubin, um, total bilirubin was sitting at 457, uh, conjugated fraction of 282. The normal values are in brackets below. ALT, funnily enough, and, and AST to a degree, funnily enough, not as profoundly abnormal as I would have expected. His gamma glutamate transferase was 290 in keeping with the history. The albumin was supported. He was already receiving uh, intravenous albumin uh, on, uh, at, the, at the other ICU. As I said, he was on dialysis, creatinine of 226 uh, with sodium of 138. His INR was 2.3, a MADRI score of 57. Now to the pathologists, this is a score that we use uh, to ascertain a patient's prognosis and whether uh, they would benefit from possible steroid administration. Anything greater than 32 connotates a poor prognosis. Um, Mr. NM had already received some steroid at uh, the referring institution where he was um, uh, placed for approximately six weeks, having been admitted there at the beginning of October, and we accepted in uh, mid-November. His meld when he got to us was 41, so quite a sick individual. His viral and autoimmune markers were negative. In keeping with alcohol, his immunoglobulin A fraction uh, was elevated at 8.12, with the normal being 3.5. His serum ascites albumin gradient was 24 in keeping with the portal hypertensive uh, etiology. A fractional excretion of sodium of 0.78, uh, anything less than one would have suggested uh, HRS or acute kidney injury with HRS. We calculated his CLIF ACLF score. Um, he was uh, category three um, and a score of 72. Of note is that anything more than 65 would suggest futility. Um, the ultrasound showed a moderate hepatomegaly. Uh, unfortunately, they didn't measure it exactly, uh, with a coarse echo texture of the liver and increased echogenicity. There was no evidence of any biliary obstruction, no intra-abdominal mass lesions, and a mild splenomegaly of only 13 centimeters. He had large volume ascites, as clinically indicated. My clinical question in terms of performing the biopsy then was that this was a relatively young male. He's only 50 years of age with decompensated liver disease, jaundice, uh, with hepatic encephalopathy and then renal failure, all of which suggesting a relatively poor prognosis. Um, he had a presumptive cause of an alcoholic steatohepatitis, uh, initially precipitated by sepsis, but the sepsis had appeared to have been addressed. He had already been treated with some steroid, and considering the relative uh, bland transaminases, to what degree is ongoing alcoholic steatohepatitis contributing to his current clinical condition, and what degree of fibrosis was present, considering the relatively mild splenomegaly uh, that was present? I was hoping that um, we, with further support, um, we would help support him versus 
taking a more palliative option um, in, in, in this case. Uh, and we therefore did a transjugular liver biopsy. Prof, I'll hand over to you then uh, for the histology. So, so thanks, Bilal. So hopefully everybody can see that. Yes, yes. Prof, we can see it. Great. Wonderful. Okay, so uh, Bilal, yes, I think uh, wonderful uh, presentation. Thanks. Uh, and um, uh, I think it shows you, in fact, the value of, of, uh, of communication and um, all the information that you, that you presented in the interpretation of the biopsy. So, so those of you uh, who um, uh, will have diagnosed this already will probably be quite surprised at uh, this particular stain. So this is a reticulant stain, and what I want to do was use this uh, stain to demonstrate uh, and, uh, and, and basically link my presentation uh, with, uh, with what you're going to see now. So this is a reticulant stain, just happens to be off my, uh, my board from today uh, in another patient who had a liver biopsy. And uh, I really just wanted to show you what a relatively normal, I say relatively normal, uh, because this patient in fact did have liver disease. This is actually a patient who has projection. Um, but uh, and there is mild expansion of the portal tracts. So you can see a portal tract there uh, and there. And that is not normally seen in the patient who has a, has a pristine liver. But uh, what I wanted to show you was the relationship between the portal tracts, the central vein, which is there, and the other central vein there. And also to demonstrate to you the, um, the single cell arrangement uh, of, the, of the liver cell trabeculae. Uh, because that's particularly important uh, when, uh, uh, when it comes to the interpretation of the, of the next, uh, of this particular patient. So here you can see these trabeculae at, uh, as uh, we go down uh, under higher magnification, you can see that many of them, in fact, you could just see a single layer of cells. And we talk about these as uh, the liver cell plates being unicellular in, um, in appearance. But of course, as we're always taught in medicine, uh, it's not always absolute. But sometimes you will see a bit of duplication, maybe there's a bit of duplication here. But this is really a pretty normal reticulum pattern. Having said that, sometimes it gets a little bit fuzzy and you can see this sort of fragmentation of the reticulum. And sometimes that indicates that there's a little bit of pathology that's going on. So the crisper this is, uh, the better it is. But nevertheless, this is a normal architectural appearance then uh, to the liver. So once again, portal tract, uh, central vein there. And I showed you, for example, uh, these would be the zone one hepatocytes, zone three around the central vein, and then zone two somewhere in the middle. So if we move then to this particular patient's reticulant stain, and some people will often go to the special stains first to get an idea of what's going on. And in this particular instance, you can see that this uh, reticulum really is, uh, this reticulant stain is, uh, is a problem. You can see that there's extensive uh, disruption of the normal trabecular architecture. You can see that there's duplication. You can see the trabeculae are, uh, are thickened. Uh, you can see, for example, here that there's something going on. I think this is probably portal. You can see that there's condensation of the reticulum, uh, as you see there, and you can see the duplication of the hepatocytes. So the counter stain is not that great, unfortunately, in this particular section, but certainly one can appreciate that the liver cell trabeculae are somewhat thicker than uh, the previous case. So you've got a good uh, uh, control, if you were, uh, to, to compare this particular biopsy. So you've got this reticulum condensation. And the next step then is to have a look and say, well, you've got reticulum condensation. Is that translating into fibrosis? And um, because if this was, for example, a patient who had acute liver failure, then you wouldn't see much fibrosis. 
So the next step is, is this reticulum then uh, condensation, is it accompanied by collagen deposition? So we're going to go to the Masson trichrome stain. Mass of trichrome stain shows that there is extensive collagen deposition. So, if we look here, for example, we can see a portal tract here. We could see this extensive collagen deposition. And the answer to that question is yes. Okay, there is extensive collagen deposition, which corresponds uh, to the reticulum condensation that you saw. So let's try and work out where we are. So here is a portal tract. You can see these here, that's the bioduct there. You can see another bile duct here. And I'm not sure about that, but I suspect that that's the hepatic arteriole. These are probably portal venous structures. So then what is this structure here? Let's wait for the picture to build. And here we've got a portal tract and here we've got lots and lots of collagen. So remember I said that the pathology usually starts in zone three, and this is zone three. This is a central vein or was a central vein, and you've got almost complete obliteration of the central vein by perivenular collagen. So let's see if that is replicated elsewhere in the biopsy. And I think that is indeed so. So if you look here, that's a portal vein. You can see the bile duct, another bile duct there. You see the bile duct there and the bile duct there. Can't readily see the hepatic arteriole, but this here is a central vein. And you can see once again, extensive perivenular uh, collagen deposition, there's the remnants of the central vein there and there. So perivenular pathology, you've got linking, which has taken place. And the other thing that is also important is this pericellular collagen deposition. This is what we call chicken wire fibrosis. So I'm sure many of you have made the uh, diagnosis that this is uh, alcoholic steatohepatitis which looks as though it has progressed to alcoholic cirrhosis. And this chicken wire fibrosis is absolutely characteristic. And typically it starts in the perivenular areas and progresses. So let's move then to the H&E. And the H&E is really quite a stunning case. And it doesn't really matter, you know, I put the special stains on, it doesn't really matter in which order you look at the biopsies. A lot of people, uh, like to look at the H&E first. There's nothing wrong with that at all. Um, I often certainly look at the H&E first without looking at the specials, but often I get the H&E before the special stains arrive. But in many instances, it's useful to look at the special stains and one should look at the special stains in conjunction with the H&E. So this then is the, is the H&E. And you can see that you've got these regenerating nodules, for example, one here and another one here. This is uh, um, that's a portal region there. You can see the hepatic arteriole, and you can see the bile duct and the portal vein. And likewise, another one there too. And you can see that there is linking. And, with these liver biopsies, particularly the cause, you do have to have a sense of imagination, but you almost have to think in many ways a bit like an air traffic controller. So why do you have to think like an air traffic controller? Well, because an air traffic controller 
has to visualize on those flat screens exactly where the aircraft are. And they have to pick up a three-dimensional model of what's going on. And liver pathology, particularly on these small biopsies, is no different. You've got to identify that that's a portal tract and then visualize, in fact, that you've got fibrosis coming across here and, in fact, that it is linking uh, with areas. And you can almost imagine, if I go under a low power, you can imagine that, in fact, there is a linking between that portal tract up there and it's coming around to link there as well. So you have to have that three-dimensional model in your mind the whole time as to what's going on. And the same sort of thing here, you can see that there's linking going on here with nodular formation there and there. So then let's have a closer look at the pathology. <clears throat> so what I've dotted here <clears throat> is an area where you've got this uh, profound neutrophilic inflammatory cell infiltrate. You can see the collagen, which you saw on the, um, on the mass on trichrome. This is uh, an area which would correspond with the reticulum collapse. And you can see the hepatocytes here, which are completely surrounded by neutrophils. So you've got the spotty necrosis. And there is, I would like to say there is only two things or well, there, uh, there are only two things, sorry, the grammar. There are only two things that cause this. The first is alcohol. It has to be alcohol one and alcohol number two and alcohol number three. But there are a couple of exceptions. And the first is a patient who is on drug therapy. And in the old days, I talk about the old days, and I remember, uh, uh, you know, many years ago, uh, I was uh, checking with the previous head of department as a registrar, and we said, yes, this was characteristic classic alcohol. And um, anyway, I duly set the report out, and uh, the physician came back to me and said, you know, do you realize who this patient is? So I said, no, I didn't. I was newly arrived in South Africa. And it turned out that... Uh, I had diagnosed, uh, together with my HOD, I might add, but it just shows you the pitfalls. I diagnosed, or we had diagnosed, alcoholic hepatitis, or alcoholic cirrhosis, in a, uh, uh, one of the um, states council, the legal council. He was SC. He was a well-known judge, and uh, he certainly didn't have alcohol in the background. And in fact, what this particular patient had was amiodarone uh, therapy. An amiodor sorry, not amiodarone. Um, that's another story. Uh, this patient, in fact, uh, was receiving paexilene malleate, which uh, is a drug that used to be used uh, for the treatment of uh, angina, cardiac angina. And uh, that is well known to mimic uh, uh, alcoholic hepatitis. And the other is a patient who we saw last year and uh, Prof. Casanides could probably tell you a little bit more about this particular patient because we biopsied this patient and I said, no, this man has to have alcohol in his history. And uh, in fact, uh, uh, that's eventually Prof. Casanides went through his records and way back in the distance, he said, ah, yes, this patient is on amiodarone therapy. And um, so there you are. But this particular patient here that we're talking about, you've heard the alcohol history, and this is a classic case of acute alcoholic hepatitis. But you must always remember the drugs can cause the same picture. Think of perhexylene malleate, and also think of amiodarone. Now, what are some of the other features? Well, one of some of the other features are that you get increased uh, cytokeratin, um, granules or deposits uh, in the cytoplasm of the hepatocytes. We call these mallory dank bodies. And there is a classic mallory dank body. And there's another one there. And you can see much of this eosinophilic material, much of those are mallory dank bodies. So typical appearance there. The other thing that you've also got, and I'm not sure if you can all see it, a lot, a lot will depend on your screen, but this is the sort of vague bluish, sorry, not brownish color, greenish brownish color. 
this is intracellular cholestasis. So it's got extensive intracellular cholestasis. And when we see this picture, that usually implies that this patient will have a poor prognosis. There is also intraductal cholestasis, and you can see bile plugs in biliary canaliculum. So what I want to do now is also just point out, in fact, that there's a remarkable paucity of fat. There's very little fat in this particular patient. And the presence of fat in patients with alcohol uh, use uh, is difficult really to, to work out. I think sometimes if they stop for a while, then they can lose the fat. But you can see the bowel plugs in the biliary canaliculum. What I want to do now is go to the past diastase stain. We've seen the special, we've seen the, the pericellular fibrosis, we've seen the reticulum condensation. And I want to show you the past diastase material. Once again, I'm just going to go to the area that I dotted. A couple of areas. Just get rid of the dirt. And you can see a couple of things in this. The first is that uh, there's a lot of past positive material. And I'm going to dispense with these areas first because this is ceroid pigment, which is being picked up by the Kupfer cells. So it can be very difficult sometimes to distinguish mallory dank bodies from ceroid pigment, which has been picked up by the Kupfer cells. You can see the foci of neutrophil inflammation, absolutely classic but there are also mallory dank bodies. So there's a mallory dank body there. And then I want to show you, in this area, another good example of a mallory dank body in a hepatocyte. So there's the hepatocyte nucleus, and this is the past positive diastase resistant uh, material. And remember, this comes about as a result of degradation of the cytoskeletal remnants. This, on the other hand, that steroid pigment, and probably that too, which has been picked up by the Kupfer cell. And then lastly, I want to show you, uh, sorry, I just want to show you, uh, sometimes people have difficulty picking up bile. And, uh, and certainly, I often have that problem. It's, it's not, don't think that because you can't identify bile uh, that you are lacking, not at all. And here, uh, also to remember that bile can be past positive diastase resistant. So that may confuse you. And this is no exception. You've got this past positive material, but I think you can see that there's a bit of a brownish coloration coming through in that hepatocyte there and also an hepatocyte. And if you are stuck, then a good tip is to go to the, to the um, pearl stain. Because the pearl stain, the bile comes up very nicely. So this patient, the cholestasis becomes apparent on the pearl stain, and you can see, you can see the bile there. See that? It comes up as this greenish color, and it's very, very useful because this helps you separate out lipofuscin pigment from bile. Because on the H and E, sometimes you know lipofuscin pigment is also past positive diastase resistant, and you really don't know whether you are coming or going as to whether this is bile pigment or not. But bile you'll see it with this particular coloration on the pearl stain, it's particularly useful. This patient, uh, in, in conjunction with his alcohol history, you would expect a bit of granular iron, which you see there. So there's focal iron overload. And then my last little bit of information is to which I've dotted. I want you to see, for example, the granular bile there, which represents uh, iron overload in the hepatocytes, notice that. But also notice that there is this blue hue, okay, this blush of blue color, and that is ferritin. And ferritin staining is, uh, these ferritin stains are with the pearls, Prussian blue, 
And there's another example there. And ferritin staining should not be mixed up with iron overload. Sometimes you will see this uh, on the iron stain and don't mistake that for iron overload. Iron overload is recognized by, this, uh, by the granular iron. So thanks very much. And I see there are a few questions, but uh, over to you, Mash and Bilal. Um, thanks, Prof. Um, a picture does really paint a thousand words. I mean, I think uh, you've demonstrated ever so elegantly the importance of the collaboration between the uh, treating hepatologist clinician uh, with the pathologist. Uh, I mean, the amount of information that one can glean from the, the slides and the, the different stains uh, that one uh, has access to, I think is simply incredible. Um, so thank you for that. I think that was just a, a masterclass in demonstration of, of what the collaboration uh, and the access, which is another issue, uh, can do. Uh, Bilal, do you have any comments uh, to finish off with the case? I mean, did the patient uh, survive, demise? What was the outcome? Uh, yeah, unfortunately not. Uh, the patient uh, demised shortly thereafter. Uh, you know, uh, part, part of our rationale behind getting the biopsy was to see um, was this, you know, what, what component was, was what, hoping that they wouldn't be established cirrhosis and the biopsy kind of confirmed the fact that there was advanced cirrhosis with significant inflammation. And then on top of that, the renal failure um, just had a terrible prognosis uh, uh, going forward. And uh, our care decision uh, was then altered in terms of how we support him. We could have probably prolonged things much longer, but we then discussed these results with the family and adopted a more palliative approach uh, to his management. Um, and, you know, I believe that um, he, he managed to pass away with, with uh, some dignity and with the family prepared for it. I suspect that maybe the reason why he had what you're saying is bland transaminases may be that he had so much fibrosis that he really had very few regenerating hepatocytes uh, yeah. to release uh, the transaminases into the bloodstream. Um, yeah. So, I mean, I think by all indications, he was having really, really advanced disease with very little steatosis. At, at least steatosis suggests some regenerative you know, capacity of hepatocytes, which uh, puts a patient in good state. We had a question from uh, Kike Lomo uh, about the role of special stains, and I think Prof has comprehensively um, addressed that. Um, there was a question which Bilal has addressed about uh, liver biopsy, which was done uh, transjugular, clearly because of the ascites and the coagulopathy. And someone has asked, uh, Henry has asked, uh, I think he wants to say, please comment on a biopsy in acute hepatitis. Henry, I think there'll be lots more uh, presentations uh, that will address uh, that question uh, about indications uh, for biopsy uh, in acute or chronic uh, hepatitis. Um, are there any other uh, pressing uh, questions uh, from the audience? Uh, I'm just mindful uh, of trying to keep to time as much as possible. Um, Michael asks, if hepatorenal syndrome wasn't involved, is there any reason for the kidney failure? Yeah, so... I think, I think absolutely multifactorial. Um, I think possibly that, you know, he was starting to feel unwell, uh, probably initial sepsis brewing uh, before he got to us six weeks prior. He took a um, non-steroidal, which wouldn't have been good for his liver or his kidneys. Uh, so a drug component. Uh, he then got very ill at that ICU, required ICU care, uh, sepsis on top of things, on top of then a compromised um, homeostasis. So, uh, yeah, I'm not sure if you can specifically label one etiological agent here. Yeah. Mish? Well, before I hand over to, yes, is that Prof. Uh, Ali? Reed, yeah. Hi, Michael. Martin. Hi, Mish. Yes, Hi, Bilal, Reed. and everybody yes, else. Yes. Sorry, can I ask one question? And I think Bilal tried to raise it with you, Martin. If yes. on a biopsy, can we distinguish acute alcoholic hepatitis? in a patient who's got chronic alcohol disease and the role for the steroids. I mean, I know the guidelines is that it's a clinical rather than a histological. So they use steroids and you've shown evidence of steroids accumulation already. And maybe that was a waste of time. Martin, can you distinguish how do we separate acute alcoholic hepatitis from somebody who's taking chronic alcohol? 
So, so Rick, uh, that's, a, that's, a, that's a good question. And in fact, it can be very, very difficult to separate the two out. I think uh, one, of the, one of the, probably one of the best uh, uh, histopathological features that we use uh, is the, uh, is, are two things. First of all, the intensity of the neutrophil inflammatory cell infiltrate. Uh, and secondly, the presence of uh, jaundice, particularly intra, uh, intrapatocellular cholestasis. If there's a lot of intrapatocellular cholestasis and lots of neutrophils, we usually find that the patient has been on a binge. I think it's, you know, it's often, I mean, the two are often, they go together. Yeah. It's seldom you see a patient with, uh, uh, with acute alcoholic hepatitis who hasn't got evidence of chronicity. Thanks, Martin. So that would necessitate, or at least given them enough courage that they use steroids, and that would have been a good idea. But remember, yeah. Prof, uh, steroids are also contraindicated in uh, renal failure with uh, an acute alcoholic hepatitis. Um, yeah. Women would, uh, had already received uh, some steroid at uh, 50 milligrams TDS, uh, yeah. but that was for septic complications uh, at the referring institution. So that's, that's why I haven't put down the Lille score uh, or anything like that. But clearly, his, with his MADRI still greater than 32 at six weeks. Uh, yeah, they, well, the guideline says if there's sepsis, you should have used pentoxifilin rather than steroids. Thank you, Mish. You're welcome. Um, I think we have to bring the meeting to a close. Um, I don't know about you guys, but I thoroughly enjoyed the session and I, I just love liver pathology. I think it's just the most fascinating thing and you get a visual representation uh, of what is going on. So I hope we've really um, whet your appetite to come back for more. Prof Hale, I think that was just an outstanding presentation. Thank you so much. I really appreciate the work that you do. Uh, and of course, the weekly Wednesday meetings um, that you have with us. Well, I'll thank you for a fantastic presentation. And I think for the first meeting, it was just uh, truly uh, spectacular. Uh, I must thank um, the University of New Mexico, Albuquerque, for providing the platform for us. And we hope to grow uh, and have many more participants uh, and much more uh, in, uh, in all of the GECO uh, series of meetings. Uh, I'd like to thank uh, GECO, ECHO in India, uh, always for the technical support. And of course, uh, we wouldn't be able to do what we do without uh, the support uh, of Cheryl and Karen. Of course, I acknowledged uh, the Gastro Foundation. Uh, Chris, thank you so much uh, for all that you do for continuing medical education uh, in the field of gastroenterology. Uh, I thank you, the participants, uh, for joining us. And I say, as I say, please do come back uh, for future iterations uh, of the meeting. Next week, it will be the Gecko endoscopy slot, same time. And so please spread the word that we have moved our meetings uh, to Wednesday uh, at 4.30. And of course, don't forget the ECHO meetings uh, on COVID, which is once a month, uh, that is on a Thursday at 4 p.m. Look out for the adverts. And uh, I believe I have covered uh, all the uh, uh, announcements uh, that I need to make. And if I've forgotten anything or anyone, uh, please accept uh, my apologies. Uh, have a fantastic uh, afternoon. And uh, really, it's lovely to see everybody back. Cheers. Thanks, Mish. Thanks, Thanks. Thanks. Thanks, Thanks, everyone. Cheers.